Yeah, I guess. Um, the malware sample we are going to look into today will be the damage ransomware. There's a link. If you create an account there, you can actually download the file as well. So, I guess it's better than hosting it on one of our servers. Because then some antivirus company may block us. Check real quick. Check the quality. Yeah, seems to be all right. Wow, Michael made it out of bed. He was, he was kind of um, unsure whether or not he wants to get up at 8 a.m. in the morning where he lives just to watch the stream. But since it's the malware sample he suggested, I should look into that. We are going to look into. Um, better be here. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Um, as I mentioned before, we are going to look into the damage ransomware. Um, I looked into it briefly before, like a couple of weeks ago, um, so it's not entirely blind. Um, I didn't actually create a decryptor for it, mostly because someone else decided to do it. And there's no point in two people creating the same decryptor. Uh, unfortunately, that person um, stopped working on it, so I am going to do that now. Um, detection is pretty, pretty... Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty old already, so detection is pretty high overall. So not... Nothing completely new, but there are a couple of um, a couple of victims out there, so they're going to create a decryptor anyway. Um, first step we usually do is just take a quick look into the file using a hex editor. Oh, it was already. Yeah, we can. We don't need. Um. Usually just based on a hex editor, you can already see a couple of things. In this particular case, you can see um, strings like these right at the beginning of the first PE section and strings like these, like boolean, false, true, system and stuff like that, um, they usually indicate that the application was written in Delphi. Now Delphi has an interesting habit. Essentially, it will add a resource to every file that includes like project name and all the unit names that this application is going to use. And just based on those, you can kind of estimate what it is doing and yeah, figure out a few additional information. Um, so let's open up the file inside the tool that can actually display this package information. Um, I'm just using Speed Commander, which is like an internet, uh, well, not an internet explorer, a Windows Explorer replacement. If you were around in the good old DOS days, you may know Norton Commander. Um, and if you do, you will be very familiar with tools like these. Yeah like two separate windows and stuff like that. Anyway, we want to take a look at the package info, info resource, which essentially gives us all the units it includes. And we can see that the project internally is named proxy server N. 
I don't think that this is going to be a proxy server, but we will see. Um, it includes a couple of, yeah, this is kind of interesting. So it imports a, a unit to calculate MD5 hashes. Um, it include well, it, it loads a unit for RSA. Uh, also for SHA-1 and for Blowfish. Blowfish is a block cipher. So, um, we can already kind of make a wild guess and guess that this one is using a combination of RSA and Blowfish for the actual file encryption. So let's close it and open the file up in IDA. And it finished loading. Um the first step I usually do is just look for constants um, that indicate the usage of certain uh, random number generators or um, encryption algorithms, hash algorithms, stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to use the sign search plugin that is available um, as an open source plugin for either, and we essentially see pretty much the same as before. I don't think I can zoom in. What I can do though is let's see. Can we increase the I and but let me check real quick. I think we can technically change. Let's see, where did they hit that option under? Ah, there we go. Yeah, that, that wasn't the option. I hate Windows 10 sometimes. Because they just moved moved stuff around all over the place and you never find anything. It's horrible. It's just horrible. Where did they hit the DPI scaling? Ah oh yeah, there we go. Let's try 125. Okay. Should be a little bit bigger now. Is that big enough? Or do you need it even bigger? You can also probably change on size around. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, essentially, I, I can't really, unfortunately, I can't really change the font size for these. Maybe if I reopen it again, it will display properly. 
Oh yeah, now it's bigger. Right. Um, so essentially, sign search um, just confirms what we already saw within within the tool before, and it imports a whole bunch of different hashes. It uses Blowfish, that one, um, and yeah. Now let's check uh, check the, the imports. Um, essentially, what we are looking for here are imports for cryptographically secure random number generators, which on Windows is the crypt gen random function or the RTL gen random function. So we don't have the crypt gen random function imported, and we we don't have the RTL one. No, we don't have either of those. That means either the key is generated using like a custom algorithm that is hard linked into the executable, or yeah, it may even be a hard coded key, or the key is generated by the con control and command server or command and control server. Mm, the most likely mistake that ransomware authors use is using the random function that ships with the programming language they are using. Now the the Delphi random number generator uses get tick count and query high performance counter. Um, to see the random number generator that it uses. So we can quickly find the functions, the random number functions within the executable by just tracking the usage of these two APIs. Now this is query performance counter. This is called from only one single location, um, which is the randomized function. And the randomized function essentially is used to um, to initialize the random number generator. Mm, this value is essentially the value where the seed is stored that the random number generator uses. And it's it's uh, it's only used in like two places. It's used here in the seeding function and it's obviously used in the function that generates the random number values. Now we can see it being here used in the randomize function and it's only used in one other function. So this will be our random function and we can just rename it. Yeah. Now the random function is being called from two different places. Um, it is called from here, which does look like a loop. Well, it actually doesn't look like a loop. Um, okay. And the other one is second one. And that actually is a loop. Now, uh, usually to generate like a key, um, the function will be called in a loop, obviously. You want to generate like X characters so you go through the loop x times and let's compile we can already see like a neat little string right at the beginning which is usually uh, an alphabet um, and would indicate that the password that is being generated is made up of one of the stars and we can see that it um, essentially does a while loop so all of this is being executed um, until v4 and v14 are the same. v14 is being passed in as the first argument into the function. And v4 is the length of the string that is being generated. So it goes through the whole list uh, a couple of times. Um, we get uh, a random call here. Um, v10 seems to be, yeah. So what it does is it creates a string, copies um, this string 
into this variable, which is a Delphi string. Now Delphi, uh, Delphi strings have a very neat property. Essentially, um, the very first element, right? Well, not the very first element, the element before the string starts, the four bytes before that, those will indicate the string length. So E12 is our alphabet. Mm, and we can see here that um, we create an alphabet copy which is used in some way or another. We don't really care. We can see that V10 is then um, equal V11. And see here that V10 is set to the start value of um, our alphabet minus 4. So we essentially read the string length here. And we pass in the string length. Um, as the maximum value for our random function. So that's our alphabet length. Our alphabet function, and from there on out, we can probably assume that it will... Um, that it will pretty much just uh, use the random value that is being generated there as kind of an index into our alphabet to select one of the characters. Um, now, we don't know exactly how long this whole thing is, so let's just check it out. We can see that this function, this particular function, that we will just call generate random string, is being called from a whole bunch of places. Now, the first place is here. And remember, we said that the number of characters that are being um, generated is passed in as the very first parameter, so it creates like a 32 um, character string here, and the string will be placed within our v7, um, within our v7 variable. Now, where else is being called from? Being called from here, where it creates like a 12 character string is being called here again 12 character strings so it seems it also generates a whole bunch of uh, 12 characters all over the place oh and a 5 character string which uh, incidentally um, has like the email address the ransomware email address near there and like a dot txt so it's possible that here it just generates this five characters are essentially like some kind of random ID that they use. So yeah. Um, most likely the password is probably going to be the 32 character one that is being used to encrypt the files. Okay. Now, the other thing is we need to figure out where the actual crypto is, right? So, um, let's try to find the function that will create the encryption object or, yeah, the internal crypto state for the Blowfish algorithm. And we can cheat a little bit since um, this is using a popular A popular uh, Delphi component for the actual encryption we can actually oh now DCP blowfish is uh, one of the units that is being imported as if, if you may um yeah if you remember and there's this neat little init key function and this neat little init key function gets key and it also gets dice now, ideally, we want to find this function. Mm, we can actually use our assigned search plugin and find the constants that are usually being used within the blowfish init function, um, which, is, which are those, essentially. And lo and behold, you can actually see that these constants are being referred to from one function only. 
Uh, let's decompile it and we can actually pair those side to side. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> so at the very beginning, uh, we want we want to set one value to another value um, divided by eight. This, then we have an assignment. Then here we have like two moves, and you can see we have two moves here. Um, then we set a variable to zero here. Then we set another variable to zero, which is this little there. Um, the reason why is that de uh, Ida kind of prefers to decompile things into into do while loops instead of for loops. They are pretty much equivalent, um, but they look a little bit different. So yeah, this is pretty much our init function. And we can just um, copy our, copy the, the address and write it down somewhere or later. So we suspect our init function, our blowfish init function, to be at this address. And we also suspect that our um, password function How did I name it again? Should I call it generate? Oh yeah, I call it generate. This one is being located at 40. Or two, seven, oh. Body, or two. There we go. So we have those for note keeping, and the next step is that our VM and try to generate a couple of file file formats. Mm. Yeah. It does appear like the scaling doesn't want to OEM where for some reason. So what I'm going to do is I would just resolution within VMware. Um, Blowfish isn't the most secure algorithm. It's still secure, secure enough. But yeah. Into some. Is this. Probably. Uh, what you can EPI
this large enough? create a snapshot so we don't have to go back there again and let's copy our ransom now i do remember from the first time i looked into it that it has a nasty habit of not encrypting anything that's on the desktop so what we are going to do is we just copy over our test file and location um let's do not encrypt. And um, what I kind of like to do is just let the ransomware run at the very beginning because you can actually tell a whole bunch of things from uh, random files that encrypt. All these files here are files that only contain zero bytes um, of various sizes and it kind of helps to just determine whether or not there it only encrypts part of the file. Um, it also helps just seeing which parts of the files it encrypts if it only encrypts partially. And you can also easily see whether or not the same key is being used again and again. Or whether or not it generates a new key for every single file. Oh, let's just... Uh, ransomware. And it's... Uh, oops. So it started encrypting something. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, we can already grab one of those files just to look at it while it puts all the files. Just. I'm totally not used to the, the large resolution, so sorry if I don't find anything. Um, there we go, let's just open it. And you can see, well, stuff at the beginning is clearly encrypted. But then, at a certain point... Oh. This looks like the original file data, all the zeros we put into the file origin. And uh, we can clearly see that stuff at the very end is being encrypted as well. but also only up to a certain point. And when we look closely at the very beginning, you will see that the first block is exactly eight kilobytes in size. And we will see something very similar for the last block. Now up to this point, it's also two kilobytes. You can then see that there are some some values and then something that looks like a, like a string. And this is actually a basic foreign code string. Um, so most likely the ransomware will put in um, the key that was used to encrypt the file inside the file as an encrypted value. Probably RSA encrypted because we did see at using an RSA unit. Um, let's grab a second file. One. And using the second file, we can actually compare those files. And if those files were encrypted with with the same uh, one in the same key, we should see large overlaps. And you can actually see that those files are identical at the very beginning. The very first eight kilobytes are identical. Then right in the middle, we see that um, the first file, which is slightly larger, 800 bytes larger than the other, has a couple of zeros straight in the middle that the other one doesn't have. 
and the data at the very end of the file is identical as well. So it only generates one key and uses that for all files, pretty much. Okay, let's go back into our virtual machine. Um, so, um, Luca Bonetti asked whether or not the ransomware would be able to copy itself out from the virtual machine since I have copy and paste enabled and no, I mean, it can technically copy within the virtual machine, but it would have to paste outside of the virtual machine and actually do that then it would have to run on the host machine. Um, plus, even if it could, it could only like plant a file on my system, pretty much. It would still have to worry about executing it. Now it could obviously uh, plant the file within the startup folder, for example, so it gets invoked on the next reboot. But yeah, it's highly unlikely. Essentially, since the, the command to paste, the file has to be executed on the host and not the, um, and not the, 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 the virtual machine. So what, we, what we'll do next is we will see whether or not we were right that the password that we generated or, or the function that we found that generates this 32 character string is actually the function that generates the encryption password. And to do that, we will simply open um, our ransomware within a debugger, which looks very strange to my eyes, but yeah, as long as you can read it, it's fine. Um, let's bring up our notes. Um, we established earlier that the blowfish init function that takes in the key and then just does, does its thing to set up all the encryption con, uh, contexts and stuff like that, that this address and our generate function is at this address. So we will just place some convenient breakpoints there. Oh, and let me guess, it's... Yeah, ASLR. Let me take a turn off ASLR real quick. And yeah, actually, I do debug the debugger. Thanks for that note. <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah, that looks a lot better. There we go. Let's set a breakpoint there and the other breakpoint at the other function. Okay. That's like another another snapshot, just sure. Now we would expect our, oops. May or may not happen. Oh, there's the Okay, never mind. I was looking at the at the super bar, task bar, but clearly the window doesn't show up there. So my bad. And we have an exception, an error access denied exception, which can happen. Another one. And we hit our first breakpoint. 
And this, we can see our alphabet string there. And this is once again our generate random string function. Um, and if you remember correct, uh, if, if you remember, then we said that in the second parameter, this is the number of bytes that are being generated. And in the second parameter, it will return the actual things. Which in this particular case is empty still. But yeah, we will just execute it until the loop is finished. And then see what we have. And we can see the string that has been generated. Um, let's just copy this one out. So we have it for later. So this is the string that was generated. We would expect this to be exactly 32 characters long and it's... Great. Um, now let's continue further. Technically, we don't actually have to... Uh, we can technically remove the breakpoint that we set because all the other strings that are being generated are way smaller. We will just let it well keep. Okay. It's fine. Let's keep. So far, we don't have any. Now we have the first file that has been renamed. I would expect this file to still contain the initial data, the unencrypted data, and it still does. So at the very moment, it tries to set up the encryption context. Now let's open up our source code again of, oh, I actually clicked. I have a nasty habit of just closing stuff that I had, had open uh, just moments moments ago. So yeah, get used to me opening stuff over and over again, simply because I closed it already. Mm. Anyway, um, where was our... So we have our init function there. There are two parameters, the key and the size. Now, there is one thing we have to keep in mind. This is actually like a class. That means there's like a hidden um, additional parameter there that holds a reference to the instance of the class. So this one here will be our... This is our size parameter. This is the actual parameter. Uh, this actually contains the bytes that we generate, or the, the actual. Uh, so it somehow created a 160 character key. Now 160 character is if I remember correctly, this should be the number of bits. Let's see, 100 divided by 8. This is 20, and we uh, actually did generate 20 characters before. Uh, no, we, we actually didn't, we, we created 32. But we did know, uh, we did notice that it kind of imports SHA-1. And SHA-1 creates 20 byte hashes. So this is probably some kind of hash. Now, best case scenario, this is the hash that we uh, off of our string. And we can quickly check this. Just go to any SHA-1 hash. Yeah, one should allow us 
AF, uh, A5, FF, 1B, or. Uh, so this is nothing like what we got passed in. Um, let me think real quick. Could be a point to, but I don't. So what's that memory? Yeah, and this is in a memory range that isn't mapped in the. Never mind then. Um, so this is actually our hash, and we and we now have to figure out how this hash came to be. So let's go back. Our into our disassembly and see where this function is called from and what it does right for that. Um. Ah. Uh, okay. So yeah, it's it's just a reference in some V table. Um. But what we can do is we can. Figure out where exactly it was. Which should be in this address. And go back into uh, this. So this is where it was called from. Um, six, okay. So it essentially gets the parameter to the function. So this v6 is essentially the, this pointer. This is the key and this is the key length. And you can see that this value there that is being passed in as the key passed in into this function as the second parameter and we once again have to um yeah only references to this function in the table so we need to down there just run it until the leaf and the rat there we go. Oh, that's another exception. Never mind, I have to read. I kind of screwed. Well, that just happens. That's why we have the snapshots. We will probably have a different password now. Yeah. Yeah, and the exception that we have before. And there we go. Need to go scroll down. Uh, it's done. Here. Copy out our new password. There we go. Password. And we can remove. just and this should
Um, now we would expect it to hit at the function again. Okay. This is the function that we called from, so this should be the function that the other function was being called from. And this is in here. And yes, we can actually see. So this doesn't doesn't decompile for whatever reason. We don't really care. There are probably ways to fix it and get it to decompile properly. But as I said, we, we don't really care. Now in ECX, we have our our neat little... In ECX, we have our uh, the length, which once again is set to 20. Um, in EBX, we have the variable, which is like this, 26 x. No, this is the actually. Register. Oh, it's an EDX. So we have to figure out what this is an EDX to figure out where this came from. Um, and this is this variable being put into EDX. This to find C variable. I yeah and then it just arc zero input in e I so essentially it um puts the variable that holds our hash into the EDI register, which is the usually the destination register, and it puts the first argument that was being passed into this function into the ESI register, which is the source register, and then it performs um, exactly moves. Um, yeah, and essentially stuff from the ESI is put into, uh, well, where stuff at the address that ESI references, or yeah, references uh, is being put into the EDI, well, into the memory that the EDI register references. There we go. And once again, this is the first argument. So, and this is being called. This is being called from here, and we have this v seventy one parameter that is set here, and it's apparently the very first. The very well, the eight argument that's passed in. So the very last parameter that is being here. So let's see when this is coming. And this one is used to be yeah some memory structure. So at offset seven seven five seven four nine, we would expect a. Well, let's count one, four, yeah. So at uh, position seven, seven, four, nine of this structure, we will expect our our password. So where is this this coming from? This is coming from the B seventeen. So. B17 is once again being passed in as a parameter. One once again being passed in as a parameter, but let's check the other one. Oh, that's just where it calls itself. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. So V1 is being passed in as the first parameter into this function. And we, oh, so this is being passed in as kind of a red context, okay. 
now we have to figure out where that this was being called from probably from some other function Oh yeah. Back to the there. Um, so we need to figure out the call. Yeah, backtracking variables is kind of, and it, it it can be kind of tedious, but you can't get get around it. But yeah, we just have to figure out essentially where this is being written to, and then we know what kind of hash it's being used. <clears throat> um, first of all, let's create a snapshot there. And uh, let's check the call stack. Uh, the stack trick. Yeah, the call. So we are. We want to, to end up where this is being called from, right? So we have something like 4CFD. None of those calls look proper. This kind of not good. Um, what we can do, well, first of all, Delphi has a nasty habit of not using, like, of omitting uh, frame, frame, po well, frame, <laughs> stack frames. There we go. It omits stack frames, so that means that the call stack may not be viable at all. Um, but there are some um, special reverse engineering tools that specifically um, deal with with Delphi applications. So let's just use one of those and use those tools to enrich our IDAR experience pretty much. Um, where do I have my runs? I have it on me. Okay. Yeah. Open it. So this is the interactive Delphi reconstructor, uh, which is a special reverse engineering tool specifically for, for Delphi. And there we go. Mm, what this tool can can do is can export an IDC file. 
that Ida then can use to enrich its own disassembly, which is kind of kind of neat. So we did just that, and then. Run script file. Now this will now take a little bit because it will start reanalyzing everything. And we should be done. So let's go back to... <clears throat> yeah, actually. So this is the tfile search execute function. And what we can do is we can now just check up password, encrypted password, the passphrase. So this already kind of looks very interesting, all the additional information. But we need to see where this is from um, what we can do what we can do is we can just uh, we can just set a breakpoint there uh, to this particular function and see where this all from I think we actually have not the whole because at that point the function was already called. Yeah, it says done. Now well done. Again, another exception, and we are where we So this one was being called from this address. <clears throat> Let's just go there. This one there. It's, this appears to be actually the, the, the constructor. Yeah. So this gets one variable being passed in. It's red proc. Not address. 
That's the parameter. That's still don't really know where this came from. Okay, what we can. This obviously doesn't lead us here. It does. So, what we do instead is just look what is being done with the actual word generated, or what we think is the actual word. Very perfect. Let's go and find our. And find our randomize uh, our random function. Yes, our random functions. Um, let's be here. Okay, so we have the password stored in the second parameter. E seven. And this is being passed into this kind of function. And this is a whole bunch of stuff. Seven. Nine, it's the first parameter. So we need to track a OV21 something down there. Yeah, it's good. So it performs a, a whole bunch of string string operations on it. This Yeah, it does actually pass it in. So this is the, the, the file create thingy parameter. Uh and yeah we were in the I'll search. Um, the music that is playing in the background are um, the remixes of Nintendo stuff. Um, so yeah, maybe it gets copyright fact. I don't know. We will see. And yeah, that actually was Legend of Zelda. But who does recognize this one? Um, okay, never mind. So yeah, this is being passed in. So yeah, it should actually work. Let's see, let's let's trace a little bit further. Let's just reset it again. Um, what is happening with the actual? Back. Yeah, that's fun stuff.
finish. That. Generated. X. So. Um, So, our pushes on parameters on the back. can see that this was kind of morphed I mean it almost appears like it adds something extra like we have the DX uh, the D6 the and the D being added I feel um, let's go yeah we have the D6 and the D6 that that was being added and we can actually fix turns this into uppercase for whatever reason and it puts in a Let's create SHA-1 of this one. Great. Create a snap. Um, do we still have the other breakpoint? That's our... Get fun. Upload. There we go. We need. Uh, it's still not the same. But isn't this actually the same thing as before? I don't mean that the is actually hot coded. All my notes. So this is this what the, was just been called as, uh, well called with. Then let's just start both of those. And just oops. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, did I actually? Accidentally remove too many breakpoints.
take away the oops then. Okay. I should maybe even just... Yeah, we know. No. There, yeah, that's generating our password. And go on. And we have this one again. Let's switch to Delphi. No, it's something else. It was just. Yes, Slurper. I'm currently looking into. I mean, we, we we traced it. We we have like an idea. Well, we have a suspicion what the password is. Um, now we just have to figure out where this password, uh, how this password is being turned into, into uh, thingy, into into the hash. Um, now we did see that it adds the D6 D D Z characters to the whole thing. Um, we can just try to add this and char one now this was what was being generated, right, the last time. That's just there. And we are in the init function again. A204. Yeah, that's the right thing. So let's just try to create the not one with the string. Not one hash. No, F0 AC. No, it's not done. It's not that either. Mm. <laughs> now, technically, I mean, we kind of do know where this is. Where this is pretty much. So what we can do is copy the, the address and go back. Oh, I have to actually paste the address to my host machine because is being switched as well. Now let's see. What we can do is we can just go to that address and set a breakpoint on right there and see the moment this is being written to. Oh, where are the breakpoints? There they are. So we use a hardware break for breakpoint for that. And we have hardware breakpoint and it's being set to zero. But that's okay. Yeah, single step. Fine. And we have another hardware breakpoint from this function. Yeah, just set it to zero again. And now we are in here. 
Now the question is where was the uh, from UX? But this is this is not what we had before anyway. So have another hardware breakpoint. Yeah, it looks like this this memory is at the moment being used by the someone else. One zero. Yeah, that's fine. And that should be minus one. Minus R. That one is fine. R. Fine. Fine. Um, that one. Control or just crash. Just crash. Watch now. Uh, let's just. So this unfortunate parent. Just like it passes a whole bunch of information into another function, in including the password. So it's all being passed in 4D OC0. This is where it RSA encrypts stuff. You would think that it's actually... Yeah, it passed in these three strings in there.
So this function appears to be the function that creates the, um, well, it essentially stores all the information so far inside a block, but still so far no... I still have the hardware breakpoint. My bad. All right, yeah. It's my fault. This is where it actually means the reference count is on here on this on function again. So this is actually the kind of the string being put into uh, RSA. And now is the question what all something that it So we damn this. Demons. line it seems oh the string list okay I did before, but yeah, yes. Great, let's 
Um, you go further down there. Function. <clears throat> in this particular okay let's just copy the line again and see what this is oh it's the I just thought of something else, but yeah, just I, I, I just want to quickly check something. Um, since we do have, I mean technically we have Fable in, in there as well, which is another hash algorithm, but I doubt they will be using, using that one. Um, I was... I was thinking that maybe we can simply um, take a breakpoint at our at the SHA-1 function and see what it's actually hashing. So we at least have an idea how it's more or less going to look like. Oh, point. So that's the hashing function, pretty much. Let's see. So we have our breakpoint here. And we have... Oh yeah, it does actually... It passes in a whole bunch more information, like 70... Two characters in there. So what does the string look like? Copy value. Don't think that we've done that a whole lot, whole lot earlier, but yeah. This Seventy-two. Let me let me check. Seventy-two thirty-six. Oh, so it hashes it hashes it as a Unicode uh, as a Unicode string, and that would actually make sense, or would kind of explain why we have a different hash there. Now I don't think. Yeah, what we can do is we can just create this as kind of a Unicode text file. See if that text document there and here. Want to replace it? Yes, I do. And let's better. We have to remove the bomb at the very beginning. There we go. And let's hash it. And we have our password. There we go. So yeah, um, so this is essentially the same as as this one. A2, A, A4, 7, 7, or you can make it, make it neat and nice to look at. Oh, two. And you can see that the hash just matches. Match. So it's essentially, it puts the D60DZ in front of it, um, then it turns it into a Unicode, Unicode string, and then 
generates the hash over the Unicode string. Okay. Um, sure, give me one second. Um, for the... Yeah, it's someone just pointed out that right after I figured it out, uh, the epic background music starts, which is kind of a nice coincidence. Um, so this is the playlist. Okay, so we figured that out. We know that it's using Blowfish, that it encrypts the first 8 kilobyte, the last 8 kilobyte, and that it adds all the encrypted stuff at the very end. So we can actually move to writing our decryptor. Now. Um, the way I, I write my decryptors is that I have kind of like a template. Go, there we go, decryptors. I kind of have a template of, um, yeah, like the more generic stuff, like going through all the files and stuff like that. I think if I remember correctly, the first, yeah, the first globe used Blowfish as well. So I'm just going to copy the, the globe one and we call it damage. So, yeah and open it up in our... Let's clean out a couple of files that I won't need. I don't need that file either. Don't need this one. But yeah, let's open it up in Delphi. Which... It seems like doesn't want to load up, which happens sometimes. Let's see, want to load now. Did the change DPI setting mess with my Delphi? That would be bad. Oh no, now it now it opens. Brain. Um, so yeah, open an existing project. And yeah. So let me move this one over. So essentially the way it works is that there's like a class for every uh, ransomware algorithm out there pretty much. So let's change the uh, malware name, damage, we kind of have to um, change the extension as well. Oh, uh, well, no, we don't actually have fine. Uh, we don't need this. Our key is essentially a string, a 36 character string. So we can, this, we don't need the 
Well, we do need the Blowfish block, actually. Um, Blowfish is a block cipher and it uses like an 8, eight byte box. So there's that. Um, oh, we also saw one thing um, inside those files. You don't see any patterns in here, right? So this means it uses a proper... Um, a proper... What did I want to say? A proper uh, a proper block mode. So it, it will probably use CBC as a block mode. If it was using ECB, which is like a kind of insecure block mode and essentially means no block mode, well, no block chaining is done at all, you would see that all these 8 byte blocks would be identical because the input data is identical and the key is identical as well. But you can see that they are all kind of random and gibberish. That means that the blocks have been chained together one way or another. Um, our decryption key is an array of size 36 of white characters. There we go. No, do we need any special options? No, we don't. We only need the option whether or not the user wants to delete the files. Um, we don't want to look for the action necessary at all. Um, we do need the brute force stuff though, and the brute force stuff will use context. And we need like two blocks of the file, the encrypted block and the original block. Um, there we go. Don't actually need the IV. The IV. Um, it probably uses a zero IV, but we can we can actually figure that one out later as well. This is our read AS block function. Well, it's block function. Um, so what we are going to do is we start off with our guess key function. This function will essentially just try to guess the key for the file. Um, to do that, it will just iterate over all the um, this will just iterate over all the possible keys, and then we'll figure out whether or not it's the right key. To do that, we will read the first block of an original file, and we will read the first block of our encrypted file. Then we will do... Uh, then we will reset our... Eh. There we go. Our key, we technically don't need the IV at this point, and we set up like a whole bunch of worker threads because we want to use all the CPUs on the system. Um, Oh yeah, we essentially do this. So we need kind of uh, some kind of heuristics. Figure out whether or not we have uh, guessed the right key. And we can actually use the IV variable that was being defined for that. So essentially if the IV is... If the IV contains only zero bytes and the key only contains zero bytes and they are identical, uh, well, and if they are not, then we found a proper key. Um, set length, yeah, we need to clean up all the thread handles. Fine. Um, okay, yeah. Here we have to. This out, yeah, let's find this one. Um, essentially, the way I usually set it up is that I 
Um, damage has like a fixed extension, but Globe doesn't. That's why it has a little bit more advanced logic there. Um, what I can actually do here is I can just check. Um, eh, why can't I? Back. No, never mind then. Um, this is extract file file name, but we want it lowercase equals dot damage. So this is essentially just a just a filtering uh, function. Um, that is being called by the actual decrypter to figure out whether or not the file is a potentially encrypted file and we just check on the extension in this particular case. Mm, we do have to figure out which of those is the encrypted file and which, which of those is the unencrypted file. And to do this, all we have to do is uh, see which of those matches our criteria. So the original file, param string one. So if the second uh, file that is being passed as a parameter matches our criteria, then the second one is our encrypted file, and otherwise it's the first one. Um, we don't actually do uh, don't do like an else here, primarily because what if someone just puts in two files that neither of those are is is, is a dot damage file? then we still want to kind of error out. Um, if that works, then we will start our brute force attack to guess the key. If we didn't have like a proper original file or an encrypted file, then we um, print like an error message. And if the key was cracked, then we will print out information. And the information detected the following key to match for the given file. We have our string there. Um, let's. So this this stuff here is essentially just a new line character. It's a little bit ugly in, in Delphi compared to to languages like C or C sharp char. Uh, well, C sharp. Um, so this one is. Uh, we don't pass an engine. That should. Yes. Um, back at the encryption there. So, I have a password. And let's go back into our disassembly to look at the generate password. be open somewhere if not then we have to find it again same way as before let's go here very counter there we go here this is there this is our seat which is being used by only one other function, which is this one. This is being called from this function and this. So this is our alphabet, pretty much. Copy it over. Constant alphabet. And it's just a string. Um, and we iterate over 32 times. Um, so from 1 to 32. And actually. String 32. Well, technically. Well, technically, it's, let, let, let's, just, let's make it just a string, it's fine. We don't have to uh, limit the length, should to... So, well, it's a 
So it always starts with D16. Then we set the length to 36. Our string. And from pos position 5 to 36. Which should, yeah, we generate the random string strings. And they are being generated using this. This is the length of this. So this should be, let's see how many characters those are. So, okay. Those are characters. We want random 58. Um, now, strings in Delphi are actually based on one. So the first character is the index one into the string. So we have to like, uh, but this will essentially give us numbers from zero to 57. So we have to add one, convert it into an index into the string. Um, so this. And so essentially um, what we do is we call the Delphi random, fu random function with our seeds. Um, we get a number from 0 to 57, then we add 1 to it, and this is the index into our alphabet. And we then just set the letter there. Now what we will do is, a little bit later, is we will actually uh, compare that we get the right password by just patching the malware executable, fixing the seed, so we can easily compare it. Um, okay, so we have the password function. Um, so we have, oh yeah. So this is our decrypt buffer function. What we need to do is, we do know that it uses um, DCP uh, Blowfish, and I actually do have the DCP stuff installed. So it's nice. So we can pretty much use exactly the same the same um, functions that the ransom uh, well yeah that the ransomware uses. Yeah. Um so we have our uh, we need our hasher which is of type DCP char1. We have our cryptor, which is of type DCP fish. We And we have the hash that is being generated, and that's an array. Um, zero to... Of string. Oh no, of, of byte. There we go. Uh, now we have to create the instances for our cryptor. component which is nil in both cases um, we have to then init our hasher and then we need to update thing uh, a unicode string which is function key and we then have to finalize the hash hash buffer and then we can create it. Then we have scripter that needs to be initialized using a key and a sign. Okay. So the key is our hash and the size is I think it should be the size in bits. Let me check. Inherited. 
side. So this is the, the init function there, right? Um... Block cipher. Oh yeah, that's the block cipher one. Needs the the specific blowfish one. So or but a but a but a but a but for. Never mind. I, I think I still have it open. Yeah, I do. Nice. Yeah, diff diff eight. So it's in bits. Size is in bits. So this one is. One hundred and sixty. Twenty times eight is one hundred and sixty. Right. Yeah. What the hash? Blowfish. The in it. 160. And then what we have to. Oh, and we also have to pass in the ID. Which is probably nil. But we will have to check to make sure actually nil. Mm, and then we simply have to decrypt the buffer in CBC mode. So this is our buffer. We will decrypt to buffer and the size. Of Go. And there we go. Should be our. Okay. Now, here in this particular case, we can actually. Yeah. yeah, we can actually do it like this. Yeah, that should be fine. We need to change this into get password. Um, we actually. Second parameter we don't need, right? Yeah, we don't need this one. Yeah. Password. Oh yeah, we can no longer do this, but what we can do instead is and simply pack F. And salt that based something other than and now we should be ready to go at least try um we are going to patch our ransomware now let's go to our so this is a random function, we need what we this one. So usually it will call query performance counter and then use the value there that it, yeah that this function returns to put into our seed value. Uh, what we will do instead is we will just patch it and set EAX to a fixed value. Um, the result should be that we get to um, know the seed of the function and, and it will always create the same kind of a password this way. So, out of this, we will move AX and we set it to. 
and then it does it. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, we kind of have to set this to knob. Have to know about this function. Number up. We need another knob? I don't think so. Although I think we do. One more knob. Yeah, this looks good. So now we now we have. Yeah, never mind. Um, now what it does, it still calls the function, but it completely ignores whatever it returns and it just sets EAX to 1 and then puts the 1 into the seed value that is used by the RNG. There we go. Um, let's patch the program. That was a... Yeah, there's some patched bytes. Okay, yeah, we actually have to do one. Um, I thought there was like a, um, a function to create a copy. Yeah, it can create a back. And uh, no. Well, the patched executable that will always encrypt using this. Mm. Let's go. And go to. Place it. Now, there should still be the breakpoints, yeah. The breakpoints are still there, which is great. So those breakpoints are for the, still for the blowfish init function and for generation. So we can just, there, once we are there. Um, breakpoint at the very And we are running, we have to click on the oops. And... Oh, that's the hash. Hash speed. Oh, we can't. Generation generate function. Let's run until it returns. And this should be our ring at this point. Yeah. Copy it. Okay, so this, we expect our implementation to return the very same value. Um, it should now put the D6, D, DC in front, uh, yeah, the D6, DZ in front of it, and it did. You can see this, let's copy this one as well, just for good measure. See, this was the old value, right? And it's still there. It was just prepended with D6 D DZ. So this is fine, this is working as expected so far. Um, then it hashes this one, the D6 DZ. There we go. Great as well. And now we would expect. And to. Uh, 
moment. Yeah, and we thingy, and we can actually extract the, the key from there as well. So this is our uh, the key that is being passed in into our hash function. Well, not the hash function, but the key function. Oh, and we can actually straight away just check whether or not it um, Um, let's just run it without the debugger real quick to create our encrypted file. Yeah, it's the it's the local local IP, Michael. And no, I haven't been singing because last time you made fun of me. So, I have like a post-it note on my screen that says "Don't sing." And I wish I was kidding, but I actually do have a post-it note. <clears throat> Never mind. Um, it created a couple of files. That... Great. Um. Up here. And see if Copy. if So let's see if this actually uh, um you will set up a block build because otherwise you can't really set breakpoints. Um options and the quality of those parameters want to add a breakpoint. So let's just run it. Okay. Um, parameter one. Yeah, it sets the file name. The original file is this one. That one is the encrypted file. That's fine. It allocates the console, which is now, which is now here. There we have the console, and prints it to the screen. And we want to take a look into our guess function. Um. What we will do in this particular case is I will patch it so we only don't use like eight threads, but only one, which makes debugging a lot easier. So we will just return that we, yeah, we just have one CPU. Don't, don't mock me. And let's go this one. And now we are in our brute force threat. And what we do there is we start with a seed of zero, uh, yeah, of zero. So we increment it, and our first seed is one that we are current currently testing. Uh, we check whether or not we are zero because I use this kind of as a um, if if I tested all the different seeds. Um, the uh, integer value will wrap around and start at zero again, so I know that I am finished. And I just set a flag that the brute force has, is, is finished. Mm, so we get a password. And we would expect this, this k value now be exactly as the other one. So this is the password that we just generated, right? And we want it to be exactly like the other one. 
And it is. Those are exactly the same. Those are matching. Like, if I select both of them, go. Yeah. So, we did generate the, the, the proper password. Um, we now copy over uh, a little bit into, into a working buffer and stuff like that. So, currently the working buffer is completely zero and we have our encrypted buffer there. Now, our working buffer is filled with the data. We check, well, we compare the memory. Uh, we, we now try to decrypt the buffer. And if this works, we would expect this to be full of zeros. But the, uh, the value is in. Right. Okay, so we break that. So something, something went wrong. Let's figure out what. So we get a working buffer, we get a link. Working buffer. Need it. Oh, we actually have to be the crypt as well. Uh, crypt it. Oh, yeah, we get pointer. Never mind, it was my fault. We have a little typo there. Essentially, what I did there, I passed in. Um, yeah, I have to pass in the data that the pointer points to instead of the point itself. Which, yeah, is something that happens sometimes. Doing stupid mistakes. Um, for the time being, we just hard code this to, uh, to one. Please remind me that I have to remove this, otherwise the brute force will be horribly slow. Um, go and the working buffer is should be full with zeros now. There we go. So the brute force function works. So this should now return. Uh, this should now uh, this this check eventually uh, essentially checks whether or not the working buffer well the buffer the we well. The buffer we just tried to decrypt using the key that we generated is identical with the buffer of the original file. Um, there we go. Yeah, it is. So we say that the brute force is done. We set the key to key. We set the IV, which we don't really need anyway. And we break. And now we are done, pretty much. It should now display our neat little message. There we go. The decryptor detected the following key. And this is the key for our file, which is the correct key. Great. So our our brute force attack works. We can generate the key. Now all we have to do is actually implement the, the decryption, right? Um, to do that, let's go back here. I want to, to change the formatting a little bit. So we don't need like a line and an escape after the key. So like this, That's a, that should look a little bit neater. I will remove the limit to only one CPU core. Now uh, let's see. Uh, we... hmm. Oh, we have a breakpoint there. Let's work. Run. So this looks a lot neater, which is nice. And yeah, all great. Um, we have to actually write the encryption, well, the, the decryption function. Um, to do that, I have this decryption function right there. We do know that we maximum uh, work on uh, eight kilobyte blocks, so we can or buffers. We seek to the beginning. We copy the entire file from one to into the other, which is okay. Then we seek the source, beginning, the destination to the beginning, and we try to read the very first eight kilobytes. Uh, we will then decrypt those eight kilobytes 
and we will write it in. Now we do have to uh, implement some special handling. Yeah, I'm kind of waiting for this one, uh, Michael. That someone says, oh yeah, the ransomware is written in Delphi and you are using Delphi. Oh my God, you wrote the ransomware. They are idiots everywhere. Um, anyway. Um, so we wrote the decrypted buffer into the file, which is fine. Mm, we have to figure out how much it depends to the end, which is not that difficult. 7, 8, 6, 7, 1, 22, that's 5, 5, 5, 52? 5, 50. I think it's 5, 52, right? I mean, do I want to double check? I'm going to double check because I don't trust me. Oh yeah, we don't. We want to. Uh, minus I one I fifty two. Oh my god, my my old brain still works. Amazing. Um, so the destination size will be set to the destination size. Minus 552, that will truncate all the, the stuff at the very end. And what we will have to do last but not least, if this is larger, larger than, I think, 16 bytes, but we will, we, will, we will have to do some experiments to figure out the exact value, or we will just have. Um, but yeah. a little bit sad that it didn't encrypt like all could have just checked this file as well mm, so for the time being at least we'll just assume that if it's bigger than if destination size is bigger than 4,000 and we will also seek to so 2,000 well 0x zero to zero, zero, 0 and From the ends, from ends, then we will read um, yeah, then you just read the buffer again, and we will it and then find it back into position. So we have to do this. There we go. And this should work. This should work. Um, now, last but not least, we have to change the file names. So, um, in this particular case, it's rather easy. All we have to do is change the file extension. Change file engine of the file name, and we just want to remove the existing file extension, which is dot damage. Um, so we just replace it with an end, and it should work. I am not mistaken. Let's take um, files from here. And put it onto 
damage folder. There we go. Copy all of them over. Run out again. Does the boss attack, which ends immediately because, yeah, he fixed the number one thing. There we go. Let's get this one. Um, let's add our folder. Damn it. And run the crypto. It now ran through all of them. Now, do I. It's one of the images encrypted. Ah, I didn't encrypt any. So sad. So sad. Can yeah, we expect only zeros, and we expect only zeros at the very end, and we only have zeros at the very end. Oh! Something's missing. This one. Uh, I do know. So, we ran into a little problem here. And the reason is that we uh, re initialized minor file corruption, which can happen. And the reason is because the ransomware only creates the. the, 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 the blowfish and uh, well yeah the blowfish object only once where well, we do it twice um for every call so easiest way for us to fix this is to just um get rid of the decrypt buffer function which i would have done anyway um mostly because oh, yeah this out um, I would have done this anyway, because creating objects over and over again for the brute force greatly slows down the brute force attack. And since we do use the function inside, so yeah, we can do this. Let me... Let me no longer do this function. Great. And I know it will now complain down here, right? Comment it out for now. Now it will complain on there. So what we can do is we can create our header in it. So we have our hash, which is our key essentially. Um, then we create our there. And now instead of calling decrypt buffer, um, we move this. Um, so yeah, instead of the buffer, this in. It's fine. Should go to the buffer again. Let's to right. This one. Yeah. And we just and this should work now. Now we have to fix our brute force. Where we also have to um guess key where is our brute force function? It's our brute force function. key yeah that's all fine and we then just have to yeah that's fine. <clears throat> there So instead of this, we want our password named K. In general, we only want to once. 
tap you always want to init it. But we are never going to free it except at the very end. So this way we don't have to create the hash object and the blowfish object all the time. Which is, yeah, kind of important. And then we will call the crypto CBC, our in data, which is working buffer. Working buffer size up. Go and then we do our comparison again. Set. Uh, delete variable. There. Well, uh, decryption IV, that also means that we I need to, yeah, we don't do that anyway, it's great. Okay, now it should work, let's test it out. Files. On the key again. Scripted everything. There. Let's go to the very end. And this time we don't. So we fix the one bug that we had. It's great. So. Now all we have to do is figure out the exact limits um, for the file sizes. Where exactly it starts kind of... I mean, did it encrypt a very small file? I think it didn't actually. Maybe it even ignores small files altogether, which is possible. <clears throat> so let's go and try to figure out what the exact file size limits are. Mm, let's go. So I think I saw previously that it uses block read and block write, which are Delphi functions to, yeah, just read and write blocks of files. Now, the problem is that probably certain crack. Or it's just no oh, okay. S, B comes before S, not after. On. No, it actually does. Ah, well, no, then. Um, just figure out the S on the. do we? Right, fine. Oh, it's been imported twice. Yeah, Delphi has a, a little quirk, I would say, of just calling the same function twice while well, putting it. So this is right. Okay, those are not the ones that. So not the. It should. Yeah. 
So it's the files. You have the files. I mean, it, it, it does see ground and files as well. Oh yeah, there we have it. The yeah, it subtracts A. So yeah, this is the right font. And yeah, it actually checks whether or not, I mean, it, it does like a comparison here and only, <clears throat> only if that comparison. So this is probably, so our, our, our thought is at this point that it will only ever encrypt files that are over less than 17,000 bytes. And stuff. Oh no, never mind. I can actually do. Or... Yeah. So only for files that are bigger or less. Yeah, that are bigger than 17,000 files, it will encrypt this block. There we go. Because uh, you, can, you can see it here, right? It checks whether or not it's a 17,000. And if it's below, then it jumps down there. This path here. Otherwise, if it's not, it's by the red arrow, it will just cont continue. Here what it does is it, it will essentially load the file size. This value here, you can actually rename it to make it a little cool. The file size value, the register, then it subtracts the 4000, uh, well, the, the 8 kilobyte value, like the 0x2000 from uh, the file size. Then it will seek to that location. Yeah, it will seek to that location. Um, read the block there. Encrypt the block, write the block there, essentially like, like we did before, and then it will fall through, and here it will move to the beginning of the file. Um, because if you uh, saw any register with, with itself, it sets the register to zero. So here it sets the distance, put it to the very first byte, and then it will do, do pretty much the same again. So yeah, I mean, we, we know how the file format is going to work, so we just have to implement it. And we, and we use like a similar logic than, than they did, kind of, where's my decrypt stream? Stream function, there it is. So essentially, all we have to do is we change the value here, and now it should work. Great. <clears throat> Um, we need to um, kind of coax the ransomware into encrypting files lower than 17,000 just to make sure that we got, got our implementation right. So what I'm going to do is I will just delete all of those except a couple of them. Except like we need an epic uh, polar bear picture. There we go. Epic polar bear picture chief. So we have those, we have one file that is bigger than our 17,000, one file that is... <clears throat> oh, and JB equals to greater or equals, actually. Um, so yeah, let's just... Oops. Oops, you did it again.
Okay, now it encrypts all of those. And I mean, we do have the fixed, uh, the fixed random number generator, so we can just paste those. Those and yeah, let's let's do a release for this. Did I delete? Oh yeah, never mind. I got built because the other build doesn't have the parameter set. Is base exhausted? Found the key. Expected or expected. Go to damage folder. And if it all works, we now have a little polar bear. Yes, we do have. Well, a big polar bear, actually. Hand drawn polar bear. Um, let's see if this file is formatted properly. It is, with the exception of those last few bytes. We will have to figure out what's going on there. Um, often, ransomware doesn't really do um, like padding very well. So what I what we will have to do is maybe it didn't encrypt the last bytes to begin with. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And so chances are for files that are less than well less than eight. Uh, less in size than 8 kilobytes will have some damaged bytes. But we can check whether or not we can be somehow magically so. We probably won't be able to recover um, up to the last 8 bytes for files that are less than 8 kilobytes in size. Which is unfortunate, but I have to deal with ransomware. Often idiots. There we go. Now uh, we can release the scripter. So what we do is make a release ball. Oh, I actually have to change the. Honestly, this this stuff now. What I have to do now is the thing that I hate the most. Because it's like just changing the version information. Good damage! Good damage! I think we have 2017 now. Um, go for damage. And it's. Damage. And there we go. Good. Build it. Um, we need to pack and sign the whole thing. Let's go. Uh, let's under development sources and so cryptos damage damage. 
damage. And decrypt the release. Damage. <clears throat> this one I just pack the file using the PX. Make it a little bit smaller and it will sign successfully. There we go. And now we just have to create our entry page. Create a new decryptor, it's for damage. Damage is a ransomware written Delphi. It uses a combination of shard one and blowfish to encrypt the first and last eight kilobytes of file, encrypted file. Have the extension dot damage. Um, and a ransom note asks contact damage. Um, Ransom note, which is named. Figure out the ransom note name, uh, which is like to name. <clears throat> yeah. And some that contain the asset. Um, we need this to be block quotes and the other. Um, yeah, what we can do is we will just X this one out. Mm, let's just Oh, I don't have to sing, I'm sorry. I am sorry. Okay. Store fonts and emails too. Um, what we probably should make it like a nested block quote. Ugly. Um, I hate what you see is what you get. Uh, editors sometimes. How many is it? service stuff? Make this good. This looks better. How do I get this? Tell you, I hate these editors. They are just the most annoying ever. Yeah. 
damage folder. Okay. Published at today. We don't have a block link or a guide link at the moment. So you can actually download it if you wanted to. That was hard. <clears throat> um, I can actually copy the favorite text. Um, technically, we do have like a size limit of eight bytes, so you need at least of at least one eight bytes. Not the decrypted select both. Yeah, there we go. And it's updated. And it should. Right. I mean, this is ugly. I think Argon is listening, right? Or, or watching? Because then Argon can fix this. Because he's Argon is one of our web designers who built this crypto page. So Argon, go and fix this shit. Okay, there we go. He already wrote me that he's listening, so there's none. pretty much done at this point. Mm, are there any questions? Anything you want to ask? It doesn't have to be about this particular answer. It can be pretty much anything. Just please don't ask me about competing products. I mean, that's kind of unfair. Well, okay, so Slurper was asking for a small um, ending summary. So yeah, essentially what damage does pretty much is it generates um, using the Delphi random number generator, which is the actual flaw that we are exploiting here. Um, I think I mentioned it the last time, but I can mention it again. Um, the problem with using the Delphi number random uh, random number generator is that it's seeded using a very very small value. It's essentially seeded using a four byte integer, and that means there are only like four billion possible seeds, and the seed pretty much de determines um, the passwords that can be generated. So even though the password space is in theory in this particular case. Um, rather huge, like, I think, how many characters was the alphabet? Um, yeah, while in theory, the, the alphabet would support 58 to the power of uh, 32 possible passwords, which is essentially like two with 56 zeros. Um, it is limited to only 4 billion, which is 2 to the power of 32. And while this number here can't be possibly um, brute forced, uh, this number of passwords can't poss possibly be, uh, yeah, can't be possibly brute forced, because it's just way, way too many. Um, this number here can. 
quite easily. It, it will probably take an hour or two. Blowfish is rather is, is a rather slow algorithm. So it will probably take like two two um, two hours or three hours to check all the possible passwords that the ransomware can possibly generate. Well, it's absolutely manageable, and it's just because they use the Delphi random number generator and they see it using just a 32-bit value. Um, it will then go ahead. It has like a little static um, static bit that it will prepend to the generated password, which is D6, DZ. As we figured out earlier, it will then just hash this string that it generated using SHA-1 and the returning SHA-1 hash is being used as a E for the Blowfish encryption algorithm. It does use CBC block mode um, and the uh, IV for the block mode initialization is just zeros. That's pretty much the um, the summary, yeah, and for the file layout, for files that are bigger than 17,000 um, 17, bytes, it will encrypt both the first 8 kilobyte and last 8 kilobyte of the file, and it will also, um, yeah, then prepend the RSA encrypted key at the very end, which is 552 bytes in size. And for files that are smaller than 17,000 bytes, it will only encrypt the first 8 kilobytes and then append the RSA encrypted blowfish key at the very end. Anyway, um, how about when do you stream again? I don't know, to be honest, I just do these streams whenever I have time. What about decrypting ransomware that encrypt the MBR? Is it possible? Um, it completely depends on the ransomware. Um, most MBR ransomware is pretty shitty. And in those cases, all they do is they print like a message and want like a, like a little, little key to, to put in and they don't actually do any encryption or anything. So they are more like screen lockers in that sense. And in those cases, it's often in enough just to rewrite the MBR using a boot disk. Um, there is some encrypting MBR ransomware out there like Petya, for example. Petya did have a couple of flaws. Um, in the very first version, for example, it only ever encrypted the MFT. So it was possible to just use file recovery tools that don't rely on MFT data to um, recover all the files on the volume. Um, they fixed um, those issues later. It now also encrypts the first block of each file, including the MFT entries. Um, it did have some issues with the encryption implementation. Essentially, they, they truncated some of the uh, values from 32 bytes to 16 by uh, 32 bits to 16 bits which caused the salsa implementation to be uh yeah breakable so thanks for the great oh, what other techniques can you use against ransomware that use stronger password generation algos there are a whole bunch actually um Obviously, if someone gets the encryption right in their ransomware, and a lot of ransomware families actually do, especially the big ones like Cerber or like uh, Loki um, or Spora, then you can't do anything. Um, but there are a whole bunch of mistakes just from from the top of my head. This weak rans uh, uh, this weak random number generator to generate the passwords is like the, by far the most common mistake that people do. I would say like 80% of all the ransomware that I broke is using this exact, well, this is, has this exact flaw. Other flaws are using stream ciphers with the same key over and over again. Like the first torrent locker um, version, for example, had that flaw. Essentially what they did is they used AES, which usually is a, blocks, uh, a block cipher, but they used um, AES in a very special operational mode called a CTR and this turn essentially turns a block block cipher into a stream cipher 
And the most, like, like the golden rule of stream ciphers is to never reuse um, the same key when you're using a stream cipher to encrypt two different messages or two different files. So if you only generate one key and use a stream cipher, like for example, AES in CTR mode, or like for example, RC4, it's pretty common, um, then you can recover the key stream um, by simply comparing an original file and the encrypted file and um, then apply the key stream to all the other files to decrypt them. Um, they are often just usage mistakes in ransomware where the, the author didn't understand the API functions that they use, like crypto defense, for example, passed in some parameters into the crypto API that caused the crypto API to save all the generated keys on the, on the system locally. So while they did uh, generate the keys securely and they did everything right, they accidentally left the backup of the keys on the system. So you could just read out the, the key and use it to decrypt everything, which was pretty hilarious, to be honest. Um, other mistakes that are made, um, there are always problems with C2 servers. Um, PC log, for example, generates passwords in a very, very convoluted way, which makes it um, ex almost accidentally impossible to uh, just brute force the keys but they had some hilarious issues with um, the C2 server. Like all the passwords were stored in one, f in one folder as text files and the folder was actually browsable. So you could just go to the C2 server into the directory and you had all the key possible keys from the server. One other interesting thing was that, I think it was for some Python ransomware. Um, they put the C2 server behind Cloudflare, which was hilarious because if, if you don't know Cloudflare, Cloudflare is essentially like a reverse proxy, which sits between the website and, and the user that browses the website. So when you go to, to a website that uses Cloudflare, you go to the Cloudflare proxies and the proxies either give you a cached version of the website if they have it, or they will go to the actual website, get a copy from there, and then give it to you. Now, the idea of the Python ransomware was essentially that they um, generate a password on the server and just spit it out, and that would be used by the ransomware, right? Um, now, the problem is that the passwords were being cached by Cloudflare. So, instead of giving every user their own password, they only effectively generated one password every five minutes. Um, so what we did was we just set up a script that just queries all the passwords, so we get um, all the possible passwords that were being generated and just used those to decrypt everyone's files, which was hilarious because the the ransomware author actually contacted me on Twitter and tried to sell me all his decryption keys um, that I already had, which was funny. So yeah, a whole bunch of issues. Um, starting from programming mistakes, not knowing how crypto works, what crypto is. Um, creating your own encryption algorithms, which is always a very, very bad idea. Not only when doing ransomware, but in general, don't do your own crypto unless you, you actually have a degree in mathematics and it has been um, peer-reviewed by other cryptographers and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, from just, yeah, the CT server is just hilariously open to the most uh, trivial flaws, um, so it can be hacked. Well, we don't actually hack servers, we don't do that because that would be illegal, but just you can you, you can literally, literally literally just guess the file name of the of, of the file that stores all the passwords sometimes and just download the file which is great also often ransomware authors use hacked servers and hacked websites as c2 servers so what we can do is just contact the actual owner and ask them to send us all the stuff that was on there so yeah that works as well okay mm. What is the next crypt the generation? Don't let ransomware on your PC. 
Um, yeah, always have backups. That's obviously the most obvious thing that everyone should do. Always have backups, guys. Always have backups. Yes, Lopra, those IP APIs are actually very easy to mess up, and yes, these flaws in ransomware are actually the very same flaws you will find in normal software as well. Ransomware authors are just as shitty as normal software developers, I fear. Or the other way around, I, I guess. Mm, no, it actually only needs 8 bytes, because it only needs one one block. Okay, so Blue Carbonetti is asking, in our company I see every week a new email that has an invoice in PDF or RAR, uh, RAR with, with some JavaScript hidden inside. Shouldn't it be possible for AV ven vendors to just disable the automatic execution of JavaScript files within the email softwares or within the internet browser? Well, um... Neither your email client, nor your internet browser, nor anyone, well, no, no Windows really, will ever execute these JavaScript files automatically. It just doesn't do it. Um, those files are always open and executed by the user. Um, it's just the way it is. Users just want to open everything and execute everything. Um, what you can do actually is, in, in your company, just set up company-wide email filtering that filters out those emails that have JavaScript attachments or like um, archive archives that contain JavaScript attachments and you should be good to go. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of uh, commercial email providers like Gmail, for example, or also Outlook already do that by default. Mm. Yeah. Mm, any book I can recommend for ransomware analysis? To be honest, not really. Um, I can't. I don't think there is actually ransomware specific literature. There is a lot of like malware analysis literature, which is quite good. Um, what I can recommend, if you really want to get into this and you really want to to learn assembly and how to um, do what I did here, kind of, um, there are free video courses open uh, uh, over at OpenSecurityTraining.info. I think I think it's called Open Security Training. Let me check really quick. Open security training. Yeah. So um, this is essentially course material from paid courses and they have like video presentations and all their slates, slides on there. And you can go through it. The quality like um, the, well, the quality of the material itself is pretty, pretty great. But the sound quality and the video quality of the recordings sometimes isn't the best. But if you're really dedicated, you can simply go through it and become a malware analyst if you want to. Um, if you prefer, um, they even have like a little spreadsheet on here, I think. Yeah, so that recommends you where you should uh, start out. So you should do this intro, at, intro of x86 assembly first and then drift out. For malware analysis, you should do this. But they have other courses like something that focuses more on exploit development or on mobile phone um, stuff like Android malware and stuff like that. So yeah, you can check it out. It's actually pretty, pretty great. Uh, and it's completely free. So there's that. Other than that, I didn't read a lot of books. I think there was one book that was pretty well recommended. I think was called the Malware Analyst Handbook, but I'm not. In I'm not entirely sure if it was this. Or was it the cookbook? Okay.
Um, no, I don't think it was. Oh no, it, it, it was called Practical Malware Analysis. There, there it is. It's called this. So yeah, it's this book here. Um, I I did read this one myself, and it was pretty good actually. So if you do want, if if you are someone who likes books and wants to do it this way, would be my recommendation. But then again, I haven't read a lot of books, so take it with a little bit. Yeah, with a little grain of salt. Um, but the yeah, the, the reviews are pretty good as well. So yeah, just give it a look. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? Currently, the decrypter page is no longer broken. Let's see. It still seems to be broken for me. So, I'm not sure. No, I can't sing to you. I'm sorry, Slurper. Let's go into settings and into the cache. Wasn't there an option for it? Wasn't there an option? I had it. Wait for it. Oh, it's. So yeah, Arion has to go back to work. <clears throat> okay, since there are no other no other questions, I will stop the stream for today. Thanks for tuning in, watching live. If you did watch live for if you did watch like the, the the three hours YouTube recording, then kudos to you and thanks for watching to you as well. Um, as I said before, I don't really know uh, when I'm going to stream again next. It kind of depends whether or not I found some ransomware that would would be great to look into um, with an audience or together with other people, or uh, yeah, whether or not I have time. So, um, but if, if I do decide to stream, I will probably announce it on Twitter again. So follow me on Twitter, yay! Anyway, have a nice weekend or whatever weekday you are going to watch this. Bye!